Hey, how you guys doing? Um, sorry, had a late start because I couldn't get a connection. But today, we're going to do, um, I might have to cut it short a bit, but we're going to do wood-destroying insects. This is a, a typical Marco, a Jim and Marco show. We go around the country and we teach classes, and this is one of our, we got about 20 classes. So this one is going to talk about the things in your house that you damaged your house. So we're probably going to start off with uh, carpet rats, then we're going to hit some post beetles, then we're going to throw some crazy insects in there. Kind of blow your mind. We're going to do some termites, carpet bees. We're going to even do problems with certain peppers, and uh, it'll be a pretty interesting, um, pretty interesting class here tonight. So basically, we're going to start off with the uh, carpet rats. Generally, you know, carpet rats will take a weak tree. So if you got a tree that's starting to get sick. A carpenter, a carpenter ants get into it, they're going to love it because water is going to get in there. And that's usually going to be the mother hive, you know, or the mother colony. And they usually shoot off to satellite. So when you got colonies in your house, generally um, they are smaller co colonies. Hey, Stan, Jason, George, thanks for coming on today. We're going to tell the difference between wood destroying insects, size, color, habitat, life cycle type of damage, and uh, and uh, and some interesting things. Facts and what you're looking at here is termite damage. All right, so you know we're gonna do carpet rats. They don't really eat wood. They kind of live in the wood. They they create what's called frass. Um, they like it west. There's areas, you know, uh, house leaks, building science problems. We're gonna talk about that in a few minutes. You know, um, they like to make galleries. They keep their 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 galleries smooth. That's how you could tell. And uh, they're like three quarters of an inch. Um, they, they do live outside and inside your home, you know, usually trees, telephone poles, things like that. And in your house, anywhere it's wood, um, they are, uh, they like sulfur, but wet, wet wood is pretty much what they want. Um, they have food, obviously, you know, like the hunt do from plants, they'll eat insects. Plants use anything. I'm just talking burger because they don't eat that. Anymore. I don't. They used to eat the McDonald's French fries, but they won't touch them now. So something's crazy going on with that food. Hey, you know, if you want to know if something's good for you, put it out. If the ants eat it, then you could eat it. But if they don't eat it, you probably don't want to eat it either. Seriously, check it out. Um, and they usually eat it while they're at. They'll eat it where you know at the source, and then they'll bring it back and regurgitate it to the queen and the uh, other larvae. This here was an interesting case. Uh, this would be how they attacked in an attic. I actually told my client, hey, look, man, uh, there's ants in the house. You probably got a big problem. I saw dead ants, and you know what? They said uh, my client didn't buy it. So uh, what ends up happening is uh, they end up selling the house. They don't tell people about the dead ants or the ants you saw in the attic. What ends up happening is you find out that the mother colony was in an entire wall of the house, and uh, it ended up being like a $30,000 repair. So you see dead carpenter ants, live carpenter ants in the house. If you see them in the in January, February, you probably have a colony in your home. If you see them in August, July, there's stragglers coming in, you know, and uh, you need to find out where it's at. And it's usually a wet area. Um, porches are, they always like the porches, especially facing the southern exposure where you get the wind-driven rain, okay? And a lot of times you can tell, you'll see them, they'll make frass. Now, they love wood. These are ants that made a mistake of starting a colony up in an attic, and then it started getting hot. And they're like, oh, boy, we got to get out of here. And so they start rushing because it's getting hot. And you'll see them. They're carrying these little sacks. And these sacks are eggs. They're not food. They're actually ants in them. Ants have multiple stages of development. And these are ants that are inside these sacks. And they're the, those guys are like the older Ants, developing ants, they're the first ones they save out of a colony. So you see those guys carrying those sacks. You know they're, like, looking for a place. And here you can see they're pulling all the sacks out, and they're, they're trying to find a new place. And generally, ants will have other plant bees to go to. Now, if you see frass, that's the dust. That's pretty much carpenter ants. And when you look at it real close, you put the stuff in your hand. There's a difference between powder post beetle frass, uh, shavings from carpenter bees, and carpenter ants. Well, the carpenter ants actually will throw out their dead with the frass. So there's like little shiny black stuff in there. And if you see that, you know you have carpenter ants. 
Now, the place you'll see them a lot is in Joy's Pockets, usually on the north side. That's where you have port R values. That's where it's colder. That's where you get dew point and condensation. So you don't want dew point condensation. So what do you got to do? You got to run a dehumidifier in your basement. You got to have a sub pump lid that's 100% sealed because moist air will rise out of a sub pump. You don't want to be running a humidifier. Uh, if you don't have to, you don't want to have ventless appliances, ventless heaters, things like that. They create humidity. Okay, so you want to keep the humidity low so you don't have condensation. And condensation happens in the winter when it's cold. And in your banjo, the north side is the coldest, and our value is the lowest there. And that's where you're going to find the ants. I always find them there or underneath doors, uh, like especially on southern exposures. Queens, all right, the ants do have, they have wings, they're reproductives, and um, the queen's pretty large. Um, and when you see a lot of wings in a window, uh, well, they're, you know, you, you have to start thinking about, are they termites? Are they ants? And I'm going to tell you in a couple of minutes how to tell the difference between ants and termites. Um, in the basement, if you have a wet area, uh, the floor there, you can see here where it's wet. So I got up, removed the drop ceiling, right? And boom, there they were. The carpenter ants were right inside there. And now they're all scurrying around like, oh boy, we got to move. You know, and so a lot of times they like water where there's leakage, window leaks, defective windows, defective siding. When you're looking around your basement and you see dead carpet ants, you vacuum them up, they come back, the dead one keeps coming back. Well, he's no, he's no special ant. That means you got a problem going on, okay, and you need to find out where they're at. And usually they're in your joists, pockets, or uh, um, underneath, uh, um, hey Maureen, underneath, uh, um, Behind the insulation. Here's a difference now, real quick. You know, the, this is a termite. Straight body, straight antenna, curved wing, uh, curved antenna. It's got, like, different size body. It's not straight. It's kind of rounded. And the wings are different, okay? So, you know, the wings, they have two different size wings in the carpet, or a termite has the same. And, by the way, the ones with wings, they're not, like, flying around. These are reproductives. They basically create these guys to leave and go find new places. So these wings, these are usually fertile reproductives, and there's different stages, and we're not going to get in all that anatomy. Crawl spaces, you'll see the dead ants. So what do you want to do? You got to rid of them, right? You know, find the nest, uh, and you can find different types of products, however you want to get rid of them. You could do chemicals. You could do natural. Get rid of the moisture usually works pretty good, you know. Um, and, and then, uh, so basically, get rid of the moisture, the ants will leave. Hey, Jay, hey, Paris. Um, now, you got trees in your front yard, you know, oh, look at that nice oak tree. Well, it's got a hole in it, man. It's collecting rainwater. Then the top of the tree starts dying. Go to that tree and look at it. See if there's any ants climbing up. And if they are, you need to treat the tree for ants because it's going to hollow it out. And then one day the wind's going to come by and boom, it's going to end up on your house. All right. And in the windows, these are dead ants. Reproductives, they're really bad flyers. So they'll usually, they're called swarming when they're leaving and you'll see tons of them. They like to live... Uh, I usually like moisture meters. I can find them with moisture meters if there's moisture uh, in the wall. This this stuff here was leaking, this stone, and it wasn't sealed right. And on the back side, I found moisture, and that's where the carpenter ants were. Okay? And here's a, uh, we'll do a couple examples. Now, here's a window that leaks, right? And it gets inside, and you can see the infrared thermal image of the water, and there's some carpenter ants up in this area in the wall. So they like moisture. Uh, that's me doing another crazy test. Um, I'm point, this is a culture stone. The problem with culture stone is that 15, 20 years ago, they didn't use a proper rain screen, so half this shit's leaking, man. It's rotting your houses out, and you don't even know it, and you can't really see it. Well, here's me dumping water to show you how much. That's two gallons of water. Boom, it disappears, and there it is up in here. And then in here, you can see it. We open up the wall, and it's dripping out. We didn't find any ants there, but that was a culture stone. Uh, does leak, has big problems. So here we go. Let's do a little quickie. We'll move. On. So we're going to go to our house. We're going to try to find the ants in our house. We're going to look for shaded areas, trees hanging over the home. We're going to look for northern exposure. They're cooler. They like cooler areas because that's where you get dew point. Telephone cables, electrical wires, wood piles, and stumps. You know, you cut trees down, man. You got to get rid of the stumps. You can't leave those down there because the ants are going to move into those. All right. So here we go. We got the tree hanging over. And oh, oh there's the telephone wire. What's going on here? Ah, uh, maybe because the ants are up in here, by the way. And up, oh, there they are. They're, they move slow. When you see them moving slow, stand back a bit. You know, they'll see you. They'll stop. 
stand back. If they're moving slow, they're bringing, they're taking a payload. When they're moving fast, they're coming back to get more food. So here, these ants are coming up the wire. So you can see them coming up the wire. They're using up the telephone wire, and the same ants are coming up and down this gutter, and they're up in the soffit area. The house had ice dams, and it got wet in there, okay? And usually, they'll like, they're staring at me now because they, they know I'm around. They sense danger, so they're going to kind of stop. So basically what we did was we exterminated the colonies um, um, in the soffit areas and we located. So it takes you maybe about a half an hour, an hour, walk around your house, stand back four feet and look at every part of your house and look for the ants and, and watch them if they come and go, come and go. And then you know there's an ant colony. That's how you get rid of it. So this is a problem here. This is all wet and that's a soffit area. That's a condensation humidifier that causes this and the ants are up in the soffits. This is this is really stupid they put in a, a, a it's called an interior drainage plank don't put plastic on the inside of your house they do that and then when the air conditioner's on this is what happens your house rots out and guess what the carpenter ants move in this house is only 10 years old and this is how they built the house and there's a lot of houses built on the west side like this all right a Lido, a marvin so all right we're going to do a bizarre case and i'm going to throw some fun ones in here as we try to do the serious stuff so here we go i get hired as a compulsive disorder woman she's a collector she's complaining you know she, she's the typical box lady you know newspapers empty cans that kind of thing pizza boxes and she says flying ants all over and they bite me they bite me you know and it's cold in my house so i go there and i move a bunch of boxes and guess what she's got a slab house over there in bayville or avon and and every duct is full of sand. Like, well, how the hell does sand get in there? I'm like, well, gee, I wonder why. These are slabs. The ants are living underneath the slabs, and they're taking the sand and putting it into the ductwork. And guess what else she was doing? And the ductwork in the kitchen, she also had a bunch of cats and dogs. And her idea of cleanliness and cleaning was sweeping the kibbles and bits into the ducts. So the ants would just follow underneath. They had the ant colonies in all the bedrooms, millions of them. And they would follow the ducts to the kitchen, eat some nibbles and bits or whatever she pushed into the soft. And she, she probably couldn't figure out why it wasn't filling up because the ants were eating it. And then in the springtime, these things, they were red ants, by the way, would fire on and bite her. And she'd sit here with her little TV over there because that's the only place she could sit. So that was a problem there. And so um, we solved that problem. And this is the dust, the, the, the duck working its lab, and that's the kibbles and bits. All right. We'll do one more case study. Uh, call, we'll call this the bizarre case study when flies attack. You know, when you see these sewer flies, you know, uh, it's a problem. Now, if you just see them once in a while, that means, you know, you got a, a dry trap in your basement, a toilet or something like that. Or maybe you got a back siphoning S trap. You flush a toilet and back siphons and a fly jumps out. That's fine. But when you see these a lot and you can't get rid of them, you're, it's very difficult. You have a sewer problem, man. Something broke underneath your house. So they, these people bought a house. Their inspector said, oh, don't worry about it. Pour down some, just pour some, some bleach into the shower. They'll go away. They didn't go away, man. They didn't go away. Matter of fact, they came back with vengeance and they hired like 10 other people so we went over there and we bought our buddy this is my buddy john young jr if you guys ever need a, a, a exterminating company speed they've been around three generations so we invented this machine and we're going to coat all the pipes so we did we coated all the pipes and it worked for about a couple weeks but so we realized okay it's not the pipes let's start digging so we go take a sewer camera and we check it out and uh we run a camera down through it, and we find out that there's a big problem, uh, that the sewers are broken underneath the house. So we start digging, and guess what? When this guy shows up, it's going to be lots of money. So we start digging and digging and digging and digging, and these people did not want to live in a Holiday Inn for three months. They just uh, spent 100 grand and fixed this house up, and the heating system was in the slab. So we couldn't cut through the slab because it would destroy the whole heating system. So we're tunneling. So there's our tunnels. So now we're replacing all the pipes underneath the house because what was happening is the pipes broke, and the gestation for these types of insects was exactly enough for the dishwasher, hot temperature, and a the hot water from the washing machine to let them live and they loved it down there and they were feeding off the sewage and they were just living underneath the slab and then what they would do we had a jackhammer we had a jackhammer holes through foundations man and we had to build up supports to hold this house up and then we found breaks in these lines and we found these little we call them a, a, a um 
little pools. Now, if you know anything about slabs, the concrete slab always, the soil underneath it always settles. So there's always a little gap between your concrete slab or you're walking on in the soil. Well, guess where? That was a freeway, man. That was a freeway for these flies. And they would find cracks and come up through penetrations, through cracks and things like that, and come up through outlets. And it was insane. And so we had it. We had to dig it all out and redo it all. That was our tunnel, and we actually decorated it with Christmas lights because we worked through Christmas. Um, powder post beetles. All right, we're going to number two. This is another wood boring insect, and uh, they just so you know, powder post beetles. You see a lot of damage in every old house, pretty much in Grand Falls and Tremont and in Ohio City. You know, because back then, you know, a lot of t they they weren't uh, conditioning, and the powder post beetles need twenty percent of moisture content. So the wood's got to be wet for these guys to survive, and they'll stay in that wood for years and years. And when you hit the wood, it'll dust out. And so you know, they're not that big. They, this is. Uh, one of them, that's a powder post beetle. Now, that's different from the beetles that are killing our trees, okay? Those don't really come in our house. Those like certain species of trees. You, you when you buy wood, don't bring the wood and put it in your house, okay? Because it, it could have beetles in them. They, they could come to your house through the wood, okay? You got crawl spaces like this that are wet. You know, you don't have a vapor barrier down. You're not dehumidifying. It's not heating. It's not cooling. It's like you want to keep your crawl space like your living room, man. You got to, like, go down there and party. That's what it should look like. So it should be clean. It should be dry. You know, you should be running a dehumidifier. Humidifier. This is one. Uh, this is termite damage of an old house. I'm sorry, powder post beetle damage, and they painted it. Um, and you can see how you could just shove a screwdriver in there. So they do damage. It deflects. Um, it's hard to tell when they're painting, especially the old houses. But you could you could tell. And if you want to know if the wood's been compromised, shove a screwdriver through it. This is what you normally see: these little pinholes. Okay, see those little pinholes? There's little teeny pinholes. This is a crawl space, and it doesn't look, it looks like it's strong until you take a screwdriver and bam, right through it. Just goes right through it. So you know your floors are going to deflect, and you're going to get cracks in your walls, and your doors are going to get tight, and your, that, 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 uh, uh, um, uh, count that center island in your kitchen is going to settle. This is the main beam of a house. Just getting eaten up. The whole house is settling, and you can see the dust just pouring out, and it was like 20% humidity. All right, and in the garages, you'll see it. You'll see that dust. That's a powder post beetle. All right, they do a lot of damage, and it's like a talcum powder, basically, like, you know, white talcum powder, except it's not white. Um, so there's a powder post beetle case study we did, um, and, uh, well, this is in Sandusky. A car hits this house. These people thought they bought a house that was 50 years old. Well, they were wrong. We found out later it wasn't. It was like 100-some years old. There was a barn, a pole structure, and they moved it, and then they, they put this asbestos siding and another kind of siding, the vinyl siding. And so we had a little problem with the insurance company because they said it was pre-existing, didn't want to pay for the, the, the damage. And you could see the powder post beetle damage that existed and all four corners had it, you know. And as you could see, the old, the, uh, the, the structure wasn't exposed until a car hit it. And then we found out that it was all beetled. And it was probably beetled uh, for a long time. And you can see how old this is. This is not 1950s. So we had to make a metal plate, make a column, you know, and we had to jack up the house. Here's a house that uh, they it, everything was fine until they put this huge granite countertop island in. And all of a sudden, the whole thing settled and the whole floor dropped like two inches because underneath it was all powder post beetled and damaged and, and it became weak. Hey, Francis. How you doing? Hey, John. So let's hit some subterranean termites, all right? And so this is a wood boring insect number three. By the way, all these wood boring insects I'm talking about are up here in Cleveland. These things are all over these, these termites. So you got to know what you're looking for. Now, these termites do a lot of damage. I showed you this earlier. Now, we, we first we did the carpenter ant with the, with the, uh, the curved, I'm sorry, with the curved body and, and, um, and two different size wings, okay? And, and a bent antenna, whereas the termite's straight. Four wings, the same size, straight antenna, straight body, okay? And when you see these guys, these are the swarmers coming out. That's a termite. And we have what's called subterranean termites. They're small, quarter inch, they're white. They're like little pale. They live in colonies, you know, and uh, that's a picture of a worker, a little bit out of focus. There's some more workers there. And uh, they usually don't like the light, so the minute you find them, they kind of take off, you know? Um, these are these are different ones now. You got the kings, you got the queens, and the workers, and that's the queen she's laying all the eggs. That's a king, um, and then there's uh, also like warrior type ones. There's different ones now. The way you could tell you have termites, look for these little tubes. 
They look like mud tunnels, okay? And sometimes they're just in midair, just floating, and they climb up these things, man. They go right up these things. I've seen these things four feet tall, and they go right up, and they go up like, oh, there's nothing to come back. And they go this way, you know, and they find some wood. And here they come up out of the ground, and they keep that thing wet, and that's their little tunnel. That's how they go because they live in the ground. They don't live in your house. The, the termites we have up in Cleveland are called subterranean. The ones down south are called fermosium. We'll talk about that in a couple seconds. Termites are picky eaters. They like to eat the spring wood. See, in the, in the springtime, trees grow quick and then they slow down. And when they grow quick, it's a lot. You can see this is the fall wood. This is the spring wood. It, they, they can, they can uh, eat it quicker. They can digest it and chew it up much quicker than the hardwood. And that's why you'll see, you'll see like this, this uh, uh, type of design. And that's a log. Okay, so they are picky eaters. They do leave mud, mud inside. So when you look, open one of these up and it's carpet ranch, it's pure, it's clean. Nothing's in it. They're smooth. But when you open up one of these, it's all dirty with, with mud and stuff. Termites, okay? And so they're a little messy. You know, they, they, they leave all their stuff in there. All right? And, um, and a lot of times you'll, you won't see them. Like here, you can't tell they're here, but see what's happening. This whole house is crushing. It's selling because they've eaten this whole inside out. You can see now that, the house is coming down. You can see the little spots in here. And, and if you were to take a screwdriver, you could poke right through that. So you want to periodically inspect for termites. Same thing. You could poke a screwdriver right through it. The floors deflect. Uh, here's one where, where uh, the entire floor had to come out, okay, because that was pretty severe. Now, here's a guy, you know, he's all pissed off because the inspector missed the termites. And, you know, he found one little shelter tube. Just because you have some termites... It doesn't mean you got to destroy your house looking for them because once you kill them with baiting systems or 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 or, or uh, chemicals, they're gone. So you don't have to re, re you know destroy your house. So this idiot starts destroying his house. Look, there's termites here, and he starts taking walls down. Like he didn't have to do this. Nothing would have ever happened, but now he's got to fix the whole wall. He had to find the termites. You know what? If you're not deflecting and your floors aren't collapsing and your doors aren't getting tight. You know, it, you don't have to start tearing apart your house. Get rid of the moisture. Get rid of the termites. Here's one where the house was settling, and we had to take it apart. And you can see that's another problem, pre-1978 lead paint. So be careful. Any painted surface pre-1978, you should have an EPA-certified license, okay, to, to work on that. So we got to take it apart. Now we start chopping it up, and that's our beam all gone, all gone. And so we got to build a plate. Now we got to make our own beam because we're not going to jack up this house. So we're going to just build a beam into the house. So so basically, that's how we fix this, beam, this uh, uh, repair here. Um, there's some more band joists. Now, um, we'll just skip that. Now here, now this is uh, this is kind of interesting. You don't know where the termites are. You don't know how they're coming in. Well, guess what? Most homes, if they're not reinforced concrete, they're made a masonry block. You know, eight inch, ten inch, or twelve inch. There's a hole in that masonry block. Guess what? That could be their access point. They could be living underneath the and in your front yard in some old tree. You forgot to remove the stump. And they could be crawling through the trees underground, going up the center of your block, and then hitting your plate and going up through your walls. And you may not even know it until half your house has been eaten up. So, you know, you want to always check. You want to make sure, you know, how you're a professional, do an inspection. And, they, you know, you shouldn't be doing your own applications, by the way. You know, there's all types of chemicals they use. In the old days, they used chloridine. That was carcinogen. There's a lot of houses with that in there. I would say that would be a bad thing to have in a house if, if you bought a house that had chloridine. So when you sell it, buy a house, make sure you inspect it. Make sure you look for this stuff. Look for chlorine, uh, chloridine type uh, um, injections because now you got like cancer shit in your house. You know, I don't know if I'd want a house with chloridine. This is a typical uh, uh, Dow chemical. They put wood in here, the ants attack it, then they put poison in and kill it. It's called a baiting system. This is a Home Depot brand. It doesn't work that good. Believe me, I tried it. You got to pay for that. You, you, don't even, you don't even own these. It costs, you know, three, it costs you, you know, I don't know, maybe a thousand bucks to put them, but then you got to pay 300 bucks a year to, to rent those. And they come and check them every year. So it's kind of an ongoing thing. So it costs money if you've got termites. Down south, they have a different kind of termite, Formosians. These guys actually live in your house. They're dry termites, and you have to tent the house. So we don't really tent up here. That's an example of tenting, uh, killing termites, okay? What's funny is uh, um, Jim and I were trying to figure out how the Formosian termites got to America. And so we took a trip, and it was, you know, it took us like, I don't know, a week a week or so to figure this out. And so we followed it. We went down. We found out. We did research and found out that Formosian termites were coming up south. And so we found this place uh, uh, in, down in southern uh, Florida called, uh, I don't know how to say it, but 
Chokolotsky. Anyways, they had a um, what they had there was a a um, mail a mail uh, um, mailing service. So and so it was the only one in Florida back in the eighteen hundreds. And so basically they were move they were moving mail from from this place to Cuba, and it was coming from Hawaii, which ended up starting from Formosia. And which is in in uh, in Taiwan. So basically, they came from Taiwan. They went to Florida in mailboxes, okay, and then they ended up in Florida and they went to Cuba, back to Florida, and then from Florida they moved their way up. And we figured this out because we found the place, this little place that you can't get to anymore. They just closed the streets to this because they're grabbing all the land. And this guy's been here, and his grandfather's been here forever. And here is the old post office. And if you look at the post office. There they are. There's a Formosian tube damage, and they came from Taiwan, and they came to this place and came to America. Now they're all over in Southern America, and uh, it, they're very expensive. Uh, this is called. We're going to call this the pill bug case. This people think little bugs aren't problems, but they are. They're an indication of other problems. So here's a client who who basically is sick as a dog. Her house smells like dead insects. By the way, insects are. Our airborne particulate, which is can make very alert allergenic, and you can get asthma from it. You get all kind of sicknesses, and so what happens is um, builders build new homes and developments, and what they do is they scrape all the land and they scrape all the topsoil. And now they got this clay, and they build a house, and they cut all the trees down. There's no more trees. Oh, there's no more topsoil, and then these guys try to grow grass, so they spray that crummy stuff on the ground and try to grow grass. And people who own new houses battle the grass thing for a long time because there's no topsoil. So what happens is when it rains, the, the, the little topsoil you got, the bugs get start drowning. Like, oh, man, I'm drowning. I got to find a tree. So guess what? They go to the house because that's the only tree left because the builder cut the trees down. So they climb up your house. And before you know it, you got dead, you got dead insects. And there's different types. Like this would be pill bugs. And next week you may get an infestation of centipedes. And they'll change depending on what bug is in season. So I show up to this house, and this lady's got all these little vacuum bags, like, oh, this is from this storm, and I vacuumed them up, and all these bugs are from this storm, and basically, this what these were, this when I got there, it was these bugs, these guys took over, and it was always something different every time it's, it, it rained, and uh, here, here you can see the pill bugs after a rainstorm just climbing up the house, trying to, trying to survive, and they're, they're going to find cracks, and most of them are going to end up dying in the walls. And then if the insect fragments start to stink, and they get into the house. And we're talking, you know, airborne particulate. This is major pollution. And so insect fragments are a bad deal. You can't have insects in your house. you got to go seal them all. Make sure that you've got good topsoil down so when it rains, the bugs, you know, don't have to come to your house. Make sure you've got trees and stuff so they can go to the trees instead of your house. All right? And so little bugs can be problems, all right? So we counted these bugs, and I think it came out to 7,000 to 30,000 pill bugs got stuck in the walls. We kind of, you know, they were paying us. We had to, like, you know, come up with some kind of number. And you can see how these pill bugs just fall apart to this dust. And this stuff floats around, man. And if you don't have a HEPA vacuum cleaner, man, you're going to get sick just vacuuming your house with these bugs in there. Carpenter bees. Well, this is another wood boring insect. You know what? They don't do that much damage. Okay, I mean, I used to have them as a kid, and I used to whack them with tennis rackets. You know, there's only two of them. They're male and female. They like to go into the soffits. They like cedar, you know. And you could buy paint and spray them. Uh, um, you could spray the uh, the wood or paint the wood with a type of uh, material that they won't want to drill in. Um, the, the queens, uh, they look like bumblebees. They're large, you know, and they put their larvae into the wood. I mean, they don't, they do some damage, but we're not, nothing like a termite, nothing like a potter pole. Actually, the termites and, uh, are the worst, then potter post beetles, then carpenter ants. And so they like fascia board. You'll see this black stuff coming out. You know, that's their little poop, and they take it out. And you can see where they're – you can't miss these guys. There's always two of them. And then the real problem is – not and this is the frass, by the way. I talked about the different frass. The frass for the carpenter ant, if you look at it, it had dead, black, shiny stuff in it because they would kick out their – put their dead with it. They make these perfect five-inch holes. Then Mr. Woodpecker comes around, and he's doing all the damage because he's – he the woodpecker will peck wood. And the reason he's pecking is because he wants to, like, be cool and make noise. He's pecking for sound. He's sounding the wood. And by pecking it, he could feel if there's a hollow point. And then if he feels a hollow point, he knows there's larvae in there, and he goes for the larvae. Okay, so they'll eat beetles, and they'll eat carpenter bees. And uh, this is all infestation of, of um, 
carpenter bees. They they make it look kind of messy because they're they're uh, they excrete this sticky stuff. It's really hard to wash off. And so it's kind of fun when you go in a woods, you see these big holes. They're, you know, the wood, if they make a big enough hole, they'll move into it, the woodpeckers. But a lot of times that they're looking for food. See here, the, he's looking for powder post beetles here. Here he's got carpenter ants, okay? And so, you know, it's a sick tree and it's being attacked by wood boring insects. And uh, these two woodpeckers were cousins. All right, so we're going to do pets. We're going to say, uh, hey, Dave, Terry, Christina, how you guys all doing tonight? Thanks for coming on. So we're going to do pets, pests and pets. What's in your attic? Bats in your attic? Oh, yeah. You can get bats in your attic. Bats can move in in a 3 8 inch of a hole. Generally, up in Cleveland, we have brown bats, and we have uh, big browns and small browns. You can't plug up the holes. You can't kill these things. you got to wait till their pups are done, and then you can screen them. And I would say use a professional to do this, all right? And their guano is not good for you, okay? Plus, they have mites. The bat mites will bite, you know, they'll bite you, okay? Squirrels, you know what? You got trees too close to your house, you better trim them because these guys are moving in, and when they move in, they're going to do damage. They're going to ruin your insulation. They're going to cause thermal bridging conditions, and they're going to get ice dams. They're going to pee all over, and then after a while, it's going to stink like a wildlife in there, you know? So make sure the squirrels aren't coming in. Mouse. Now, this is pretty, nobody, nobody, you look at this in your attic, go in your attic and look at this stuff. And if it doesn't look all perfect and you got, it's all like little holies and uh, little, little, these are all mouse paths, man. These are mouse freeways, man. They live in your attic, especially if you live out in the woods. You got mice in the attic and you got mice above your drop ceiling in the basement. Look at your drop ceiling panels. There's probably poop up there, all right, especially when you're living out in the country. And these mice like to go through here. You know, after a while, they ruin it because they pee, okay, and they stink it up and, and they ruin the, you know, maybe not so much the R value, but it starts to stink. Raccoons in the attic, same thing. Take care of the holes. Don't let them get in your chimneys, chimney caps and screens. And look for dirty gutters. They climb up gutters. You see dirty gutters, that's a raccoon going up. All right, and we have possums, right? And and we have owls. Now, I haven't seen any owls, but I think that would be pretty cool. Sometimes you get cats that fall in the attics, and they fall down into get stuck in the joists. There's a cat that was stuck in a wall for like four days, and we didn't even know it until we like start smelling his pee. We love these guys. Ladybugs hang out for the winter now. You know they're hiding in your attic. Uh, then you got wasps, and we got honeybees, and we got hornets, and we got bears. Bears, yeah, we got bears in the attic, and snakes. Now this I don't have I don't have this in one of my other classes. There was a snake. Big black snake living in an attic in Pennsylvania. And we saw snake skins all over trying to figure out what the heck. And and then the, the owner of the building says, oh, yeah, every two weeks the snake goes up on the roof and he wraps himself around this chimney. And he just sits there and he waits for birds to fly by and just grabs them right out of the sky as they fly by and gets the bird and goes back into his little attic and hangs out in the attic. He, he was the attic snake. And, we, of course, we have monkeys in attics. So let's talk about squirrels. Squirrels are pretty much active all year round. They they like trees, but they also like to live in homes, especially attics. Okay, um, and you guys all feed the squirrels, and so we're not gonna get into all that. But they you know you, they store or acorns in your attic. They'll also be you know in the ground. Okay, these guys could swim, uh, they could jump. You know they're just amazing animals. So here you see a hole you know side of a house. Well you know what man. If there's a hole outside, there could be a hole inside. Well, yep, there was one here for sure. And this little guy, he had a nest in there, and somehow he chewed his way through and fell into the house. It was a vacant house. And poor guy died because he went to the toilet and drank uh, uh, antifreeze. Okay, it was a winterized house. But you want to be careful going into places, especially crawl spaces, you know, uh, that might have wildlife. Okay? You want to be very careful. Um then uh, sometimes dogs will find will hear stuff in walls. This is a dog finding a squirrel, and there could be a little problem there, you know, a squirrel versus dog. So you don't want these things live in your house. You see, my if you see squirrels on your roof, they're in your attic, man. Go take care of it. Uh, the, the 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 skunks, the, not the skunks, the uh, raccoons. You can hear them. Okay, you want to get rid of them because they're going to ruin everything up there. Um, so they will make holes underneath your wood. Uh, I'm sorry, underneath your shingles, they'll, they'll walk in that gutter. You can't even see this from the ground. And they'll have a hole right there. They'll chew the hole right into there. Um, in the soffit, sometimes you're lucky, and you could actually see the holes. 
Okay, then people, like here you can see that they chew their way through here, and they chew their, you say, put a screen there, and this girl says, screw you, man. He made another hole right there. So they're pretty aggressive, okay? Wood shingles, you know, you got wood shingles, old wood shingles, you're, you're going to have high probability you can get squirrels up in there. You want to look for the squirrel nest, you know, sometimes you got them inside these uh, uh, air vents in your attic. Sometimes you have them in, in the uh, fans, okay? Sometimes you go in your crawl space, your attic, and you see this. Where the insulation is torn off. Well, guess what? That's an animal. That's that's probably not a squirrel. That looks like a raccoon, okay? Because if you look how tall that is, that wouldn't be tall enough for a squirrel. Now, if a squirrel gets in your house accidentally, you're in big trouble if you're not home all day because he will chew his way out. He will, he will chew on this window and on this window. He will chew every window. He won't just stick on one. They're not that bright, and he'll ruin your entire house. You'll be replacing all the trim work in your house, so don't let these things loose in your house, okay? Um, there are sometimes like here, you can't even see the hole. There's a tree. They jump on a tree and they go into this hole and they're up in the attic. So when you go to your attic, get your Christmas decorations, it might be a problem. Now this is a, we call this the dead squirrel hunt. Um, basically we get called in and, uh, the, uh, um, the tenant was complaining about odors and landlords like, nah, man, my house don't stink. She goes, it stinks, man. It stinks real bad. It's been stinking for four months. Squirrels that die will spit, will stink for three, four months. Uh, raccoons much longer. And so I get out my little gauge and I'm, and I'm, I'm like trying to find this dead squirrel in this house. Come figuring there's one in her because it had trees hanging over. So I got this little gauge. I, I'm, I'm going around trying to find the smelliest outlet. And there it is. I find this outlet that stinks pretty bad. And so I take it apart. And uh, hey, citizens, man. And so what we do then is we uh, cut cut the wall, and there's our, our laborer there. He's going to take a sawzall, and he saws on cutting. Oh, there it is, Mr. Squirrel. Mr. Squirrel got electrocuted, man. He got electrocuted chewing on wires, and he died in the wall, and the whole house stunk. And so he pulled it out, and there's our landlord. We made him carry the dead squirrel up. Um, now, if you've got vents uh, that lead to your furnace, you know, it's rusted, go check them out. Here's a squirrel living in the vents. And uh, this vent would actually travel, and the squirrel would, squ squirrels would fall out of the hole here. And you don't want to have this hole here anyways. This is a cold, airy turn. And if you've got a cold, airy turn in a crawl space that's vented, well, guess what? You're sucking cold air outside in your house. Your heating bill is going to be astronomical. So you don't want a vented crawl space in Ohio. You want a conditioned crawl space. And I do have a lot of videos on that on YouTube under Cleveland Marco on crawl spaces and how to condition them properly and you definitely want to do that especially if you want to save money so this squirrel would fall fall through this hole he didn't know how he what he, what he knew he can get back up he couldn't jump and get in that little hole and so I, I went down in there and helped these people out and i found a that's me going into a crawl space and i found mr squirrel and there was like i would say mr squirrel and his seven cousins were down in there so let's hit the pets we're going to do cats dogs and birds well, let's talk about cats you know, they say today there's 230 million pets in their homes, dogs, cats, and birds. There's 320 million Americans or people in America. And so that's pretty sick that, you know, there's almost more pet, just as many pets as there are humans in America. So we, we, something's definitely wrong with this, okay? Well, we're going to, that's a whole nother, another class or another, another PowerPoint. But so these cats, there's probably 130 million of these are cats. And, you know, you got the urine's a real problem with cats and dogs. Um, and the urines are all different depending on what you feed your animals. And it usually ruins your floors, you know. And, and if you've got male cats, they're going to spray, ruin your walls and your drywall, okay. And so sometimes I get case studies, and I do a lot. I get all the, all the crazy ones I get where people are sick in their homes or they hear noises. And so they call me up, and i got to go figure out what it is. And sometimes it's really stupid simple stuff okay sometimes it's more difficult okay like like noises and ghost staining not ghosts ghost staining the, you know things like that dust in homes and so this lady says she's sick she says oh i'm sick in my house there's mold in my house and so i go all right we'll go figure it out so i go there and uh, i call it the sick lady i get to their house the lady's got 16 cats okay and she shows me where the mold's at i'm like really you're sick from the mold. And the only reason she had mold was because she was using so much water. Every room had a cage and a cat. And she could only let certain cats out at certain times because certain cats couldn't deal with other cats. Sixteen cats, imagine that, in a house. And they all had their own cage and they all had their little free time running around. And then she had 16 of these things, okay, and 16 waters and 16 bowls. And so that was creating humidity. And that humidity was probably causing her little mold problem. Not to mention she said she was sneezing and getting sick. 
Well, you know what? You got cat dander and she had carpets. So once you have uh, a lot of humidity in the house, you're going to get dust mites feeding on, on, on the cat skin and, 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 and dander and things like that. And a, a dust mite will produce 50 times its weight in fecal pellets per day. And when that stuff breaks down, that stuff could float around. You're talking 0.5 microns, man. You're breathing this stuff. It's easy to get asthma. You can get sick from this stuff, you know, from the dust mite fecal pellets. So basically, you know, I told her, you know, I don't know how I'm gonna, I don't know how I'm going to help you. And um, she had food everywhere. She then she was using air fresheners. Oh my God! You want to die? Buy ten of these. Put them in your house. Close your doors. You'll be dead in the morning. This stuff is poisonous. Anybody using this stuff, you're better off smelling your dog. You're better off smelling your cat. You're better off smelling whatever food you're cooking than smelling this shit. This is poison. It doesn't disappear. It ends up coating your lungs, man. And you wonder why half America is sick. Get rid of this stuff. Don't use it. Don't put this stuff in your dryer either. That's all poison. It's garbage. It's no good. You know, she had these little things all over the house, and these are little dust mites. And so, you know, so we're like, what made the lady sick? Was it the mold? Oh, by the way, there's mold in the attic. Uh, was it the mold on a wall? Was it the 30 air fresheners? Was it the cat dander, high humidity? Was it the dust mites? Was it dust mite fecal pellets? You know, so we, she went, well, what do I do? What do I do? You know, we're like, well, you know, we had a solution for you, lady. We told her to buy a bigger house. All right, so <laughs> we did. We told her to buy a bigger house. Um, so one more little cat one. This is this one's kind of crazy. Um, uh, I I did a rate. I do radon testing, and and the lady calls me. She goes, goes, you can't leave that radon tester. My cat's going to eat it. I'm like, really, really. I go, don't worry about it. Well, she called me eight hours later and said the cat ate your electrical cord. And she did. The cat chewed my cord. So I went to go redo the radon, and this lady had a tent for the cats. She had a television set with bug TV. There's bug TV. I swear to God, bug TV. The cats would hang out and watch bug TV. And then they would go chew my radon machine. Um, this is the case study called the sick lady and the cat that lost its meow. <laughs> Seriously, that's what I got hired for. The cat couldn't meow anymore. And so, you know, I go to her house and, and she's sick too. And so I go through the house and look, that's one room. Uh huh. You think there's something wrong with this lady? Oh, that's another room. You think just maybe something might be wrong? Oh, what's that? Oh, she sleeps with her cat. Lovely. So, you know, I don't know how to help people like that. You know, I mean, you know, you're taking all kind of medica medicines. You're good. You can't be taking, even if that's good medicine or vitamins, you can't be mixing all that stuff up. That's going to make you sick. And who knows? You probably drop a few and the cat's probably eating it. Um, another thing, just so I have a video on YouTube called Toxoplasmogande, and basically 30% of Americans have it. It's a parasite that lives in your brain, and, it's, and if you have a cat, you can have it. And it's, it does cause men uh, to be a little ADD. Um, it makes women smarter, I don't know, but it also makes them promiscuous, and it also causes a 40% uh a reaction slowdown rate, so it does cause a lot of car accidents. So a lot of Americans are walking around with these parasites in their brain, and they do eat your brain, but yeah, usually your brain rejuvenates. You can live with these things, but it does mess you up a bit. And it, sometimes if you have a lowered uh, immune system, it could turn to toxoplasmosis. That's a problem, and there's a lot of people who have toxoplasmosis. So if you got a cat, look up toxoplasmogande, and you may be taking your cat to the park um, one-way trip. Anyway, so here's one more cat story. This lady the girl buys a house, right? And two months later, she's got this stuff oozing out of her wall. She can't figure it out. And uh, there's like stuff, brand new carpets are starting to rust by the doors. And this, this stuff is coming right out of the wall. Uh, and you can see how this is all painted. And uh, moral story was the lady that, that owned the house was a collector, had like 16 or more cats. And um, basically, the cats totally trashed the place. She ended up dying, and um, the uh, the brother came up from Florida and like hit everything with paint and put new carpets down, thinking nobody would find out about it. But within two months, all that stiff, all that these were male cats peeing on the walls. Man, it came right out of the walls, and you could see that. And that's a, another odor meter I was using. Uh, and here you can see that he actually painted the floors too, because the floors were all full of urine. And you can see the new tack board that he put down. Then he even doubled up, trying to you know hide the rippling effect 
of the wall from the P for the males. And there's a I mean, it just looks bad. And I can't believe their home inspector missed this. And you can see here the cat's P here, and he kind of painted it and cocked it. Like, how do you miss this stuff, inspectors? Uh, and here, here they, this was the old peed stuff, and they added a few little pieces. It was This ended up being a non-disclosure lawsuit, what this was about. So she was basically a hoarder. I'm sorry, 13 cats. And she left the house for two weeks. Nobody could find her, and they found her dead somewhere. And, uh, and the only reason people knew about it is because the neighbors were complaining about the odors that were coming out of the house. This is a, a builder. Uh, a builder builds a house. These people sue the builder for all the stuff. And one of the things they sued for was faulty carpet. And like, look, the carpet's falling apart. It's falling apart. And so I was the expert. You know, I help builders sometimes. You know, I don't go against them all the time. So I was on his side. He paid me to be his expert witness. So I go and take a magnifying glass here, and you can see the scratching on the bottom of the door from the paws of the cat. So the cat would get locked in the room, and the cat did this to all the rooms and destroyed the carpets. They tried to sue the builder for it. And you can see these little scratches. And that, that case got thrown right out of court. Uh, dogs have problems. Maybe, you know, dogs, I'm not going to pick on dogs, but, you know, crazy dogs do bad things to homes. You can see here uh, what happens. Hey, Jim. Hey, Paris. Hey, Charlotte. And you can see dogs. Man, you can't let dogs do this to your house. And people, there you would not believe how many people live like this. I, I've, been, I've inspected 18,000 homes. I've been doing this for 33 years, and I run around. I see this all the, not all the time, but a lot. And people live like this, and they, they got the cat problems and bird problems. Uh, and one day I was, I was doing a case study in this house, and, and it was, uh, they were building a Home Depot or something. There was dust going across the freeway in Menors. People were complaining about the dust in their house. They kept cleaning it and couldn't figure out where it was coming from. I already knew where it was coming from because I drove around a neighborhood, and it was a construction site. So as I'm going through the house, I'm like doing my dog and pony show, and I go by this dog, and he's sleeping there, and I put my temp, because I got a temperature gauge, and I take a temperature, and I go 70 degrees. I go, lady, lady, we got a problem. And she comes in there and goes, what's wrong? I go, I think your dog's dead. She goes, oh, no, 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 no. We stuffed him. We stuffed him. He's our pet. We love him. People stuff their pets. Is that insane? Birds. Okay, let's talk about birds. Um, birds are a real problem. And uh, basically birds, uh, not the birds themselves, but pigeon shit is, uh, and bird shit is bad. So you don't want to have birds flying around your house. You don't want to have any pigeons. And I know this firsthand. This is, uh, I'm an urban explorer, so I'm down in Arizona, and I find this abandoned racetrack um, that I kind of sneak into. And um, it, it closed in 1962. So when I get upstairs to the track areas where the seats are at, I start walking at what appear to be dirt. That's not dirt, man. Those were piles, those were piles of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, um, droppings from pigeons. And after... Right at that point, I realized what happened, and then I looked up, and there's birds everywhere, and I, I swear to God, within five minutes, I felt something weird in my body, and I go, oh, my God, I got it, and I ended up getting histoplasmosis, and it, 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 that night, I started coughing the night. Within three days, I was, like, you know, deathly ill, and uh, basically, they treated me for pneumonia, and it, it lasted for a long time, and so histoplasmosis is a real problem. You don't want to get it. It resembles ammonia. And if you get it once, and your body's going to be more susceptible to it the second time, you might not be so lucky. Um, you want to check all your, your vents for your dryers. You want to check all your vents for your bathrooms because birds move into them in the spring. And, you know, they're going to be pooping in there, okay? You don't want that. Now, this bird's nest killed a 32-year-old. So, you know, you got to make sure you got chimney caps and screens. Make sure you have your furnaces clean and inspected. Check your water heaters. Check the draft on them. Do combustion analysis. You can't have a bird's nest slowing down the draft, and then you have incomplete combustion. And if you have incomplete combustion, you can create carbon monoxide, and you can get sick. Even low-level carbon monoxide poisoning is a problem. So this is a bad bird's nest. It killed a 32-year-old. Um, now, here's a bird's nest where, where the dog was trying to get to the bird, and the bird was just sitting there with his little eggs laughing at the dog because of the glass window. and Or it could have been a cat, but the, the, ant, the pet destroyed the window. When you see big nests in your attic, basically this just means that the bird's nests keep falling onto a pile because they're like in a vent or a ridge vent, and it gets heavy and it falls down, and they can't figure out because birds aren't that smart. And so these piles can get big. It also kills your ventilation system, which can cause problems to your roof and heat up your attic and cause a house to get hot. So check those out. That's a bit monster bird's nest, right? Really, it's not. It's probably like 30 years old uh, just from piling up. 
We talked about the pigeons. If you got millions of pigeons on the roof, they're in your attic. Look at this guy. This guy's got a furnace with pigeon shit on it. And then these these are uh, supply ducts and return ducts. And so you can't have this in your house because you're gonna everyone's gonna get sick from this. So you got to go check out your attics, okay? And this could be bat guano. Same thing. Same kind of problem, okay? Um, so mice. Let's do some mice stuff. Um, you know, mice, mice are, you know, mice do damage. Now, you look inside underneath your sink and you got little toilet paper there. That's a mouse, man. He's making a nest somewhere. But they also like, you know, they go in holes and they die. But they like to chew. They like to take this asbestos. This is not a tube wearing. It's made of asbestos. And they like to take that to their nest. And guess what? You see this stuff. Go in your attic and check it out, man. You can start fires. So mice can burn houses down. So that's me looking for problems with electrical wiring and... These mice got up in there, and they did all kind of damage. If you don't have knockouts in your in your electrical boxes, they're going to move in your box and short it out. Here's a dead mouse in here. He got fried. He got the hot and the neutral, zapped them out. But you know what? They can start a fire. Here's a dead mouse, and he hit he hit the hot, the ground, and the neutral got fried. Um, now, if you're going to poison your mice, you're going to play this game, that's fine. But what's, you're going to expect to have odors, and when a mouse dies, it's going to stink for like a week and a half. That weird smell is a dead mouse. And it goes away. Now, a rat goes for like three weeks, four weeks. A chipmunk's around five weeks. A squirrel's like two to three months. Uh, 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 and a, a raccoon is like, like six months, all right? So I don't know about this poison, okay? Um, this is pretty much the way I like doing it. You know, these are good mice. You know, sticky traps, you know, and, and snap traps. Now, if you see this in your attic, this is not normal insulation. These are mouse little freeways. These guys are running around here, man. These are all little mouse paths. They're little mouse holes. There's a hole there, okay, and there's a little hole there. So they love attics because they go down to the bottom, and your and your drywall is warm, and they love sitting there. Um, there's a mouse hole there, and you can see where I circled all the holes, okay? This house is infested, and they kept killing mice, but they couldn't figure out. you got to find out where they're coming in. You know, if you live in the woods or something like that, you got to figure out. you got to be like a mouse, figure out how he's getting in. Is he, is he getting in from noise? Is he, mice have whiskers, okay? So, And they like to run in straight lines. So if you've got a hole, let's say your air conditioning vent, and, you're not, and your cold air returns aren't sealed in your basement, then that causes negative basement pressure, especially when you close your door upstairs. So now your basement sucks, plus you're getting radar. On, right so now you're sucking your basement and that air's coming through that little air conditioner hole the mouse is kind of walking around he's like ooh, his whiskers like ooh, i, I can feel that and he follows finds the hole man with his whiskers it goes right in and and that's why a lot of people have mice in their homes because of the penetrations you want to seal all those now here's a bunch of mice i thought that they would get they would get uh, uh, uh poison with cancer from this asbestos this is uh uh, yeah, they, 33 million homes got this. Most of it's hidden now with other insulation, and it's called vermiculite. And so the, the mice were living in the vermiculite. It must, must have not killed them. And then you pull the insulation down, you can see their paths. This is up in the ceilings. You can see their urine paths. I mean, they just they just pee and they run through the shit. You know, they don't, they're, ra raccoons will have their own latrines, okay? And, here, and then we take the siding down to find out how they're getting in because they're getting underneath the siding underneath it and then look at these holes man they, they had so many holes they, they had no problem getting in this particular house that's a new new house rats you know you don't want rats in your house so make sure you know um keep your toilet lids down because a lot of those basement toilets the rats will come up right through the toilet uh, that's why they got rid of a lot of the toilets in shaker heights because the rats were coming up into the homes into the toilets you imagine sitting down and a little fluffy comes out comes out swimming out from underneath you know underneath your legs well that happens Rats. Here's a rat stuck in a sub pump. Okay, let's do some raccoons. You know, they're, they're, these are nice animals as long as they're in the woods, right? Um, and they'll pretty much eat whatever. They'll eat fruit, berries, grapes, you know, eggs. They'll eat anything pretty much. Um, garbage cans, old food, new food, rotted food, and um, they get in your attics. Now this guy didn't have a good day. He got electrocuted by the light. Um, this guy's looking at you through the chimney, so you got to put caps and screens on there. And then when they're in your attic, they make latrines. So then you can sometimes see the urine coming through your ceilings, and all of a sudden that room stinks. So you got to take that drywall down, man. And if there's more than one, two, three, four coons up there, they're going to have fights. They're going to destroy stuff. And then you're going to get ice dams, too, because they're going to damage the insulation. You're going to have thermal bypass and thermal bridging conditions. Here's a latrine. Where in a closet where you can see the pee coming down. And a lot of times you go in your crawl space, you'll see their dirty paws on the walls, and be careful because they're probably stuck down there. 
Um, here's a house that people went away for the summer to their summer home. The raccoons moved in. You can see the temperature, 66 degrees. They destroyed all the insulation. You can see the thermal image. They had icicles, and they came when the gutters fell down. And here's their latrine. So, you know, it's like a chain reaction, okay? Skunks, they like to make holes. You know, they like uh, skunks like porches. So make sure your decks in your backyard uh, all have uh, lattice around or chicken wire because they're going to move down in there. Um, and if it smells like a skunk, it's pretty much a skunk, okay? And, and let's say you have a skunk, and then all of a sudden he's not stinking, but then you have a party, a graduation party, now he stinks. He'll ruin your whole party. You're not going to be able to get rid of him. So you got to hire trappers to get rid of the skunks, okay? Groundhogs, the problem with groundhogs is uh, they'll dig holes around your foundation, and you won't see the holes, but when it rains, these holes get full of water, and your basement start leaking, and then you got hydrostatic pressure, and you got horizontal cracking, and you got foundation failure, so, you know, you can't have the groundhogs digging around either, okay? And um, they, they, uh, they get in all different ways. Like this groundhog was getting in this barn through a cat door. Bats. We, we talked a little bit about bats. You know, um, uh, bats as far as uh, droppings, you want to look for the. You can hear them sometimes. Usually they come out at dusk. you got 15 minutes. Walk around your house, and you'll see them coming out one by one. Usually they start out with 100 or 200 bats. They'll end up with being around 300. That's about the average size colony that we have up here. Now, we're not having as many bats because of white nose syndrome, you know, so it's kind of sad. You can't kill these guys, okay? Do not kill bats. They eat mosquitoes. A bat will eat 1,000 mosquitoes in one night, so if we don't have bats. We're in big-ass trouble, okay? And so, um, you want to look for this. This is bat guano. This is a, a big, a lot of bats. This is not one male. So this would be a, a roost. Okay, when you got this much, that's they're probably sitting up in the soffit areas. Uh, that could be a male because the males are not allowed in the in the roost. The roosts are all female with the pups. So the males get to hang out somewhere else. So this is probably just one or two loners. Okay, that's a that's a, a, a not a male. That's a roost, and you can see they're always at the highest point. And th those, these are actually my photos of a barn. When you see black staining, that's the basket. And that's only like three-eighths of an inch of a hole, too, by the way. And um, so, you know, groundhogs, uh, we talked about that in a minute. They, they also they undermine, they undermine um, slabs. So we're going to end this uh, today uh, with a little short story. And it's kind of funny. It's going to be a mouse story. And so what does Halloween, mice, and big houses have in common? So this is a tale of the three girls. So you got three girls. They're my daughters, okay? You got, you got the, the two girls over here and one over here. And so the left two girls, they, they, they go out, you know, for trick-or-treat, you know, go get some candy. And, and so the girls on the left just stayed in our neighborhood because we live like in a normal neighborhood. And the other girl thought she'd go see one of her Richie friends and go to the big houses. So she went to the rich neighborhood. And so when they got back that night, we looked at the difference in candy bars. And here's my neighborhood, Twix, and there's the big neighborhood, Big Twix. And my neighborhood, Crunch, and, and her neighborhood, Big Crunch, and, and, and Kid Cats. Look at this. This is my neighborhood where I live, and this is uh, on Lake Avenue over there by the, by the, by, you know, uh, uh, by the water. Okay, so, they, so basically I'm looking at these things, and like, all right, girls, you're going to bed because they were going to take them to the room. No way. They'll eat that shit all night. You know that, right? So we're going to hide at least for the first night. They probably ate a ton of this already. So I sit on the bed, and I take this, and I've got my eye on this buddy right here. It's called the World's Finest Chocolate Bar, the only one there. It's probably a $2 chocolate bar. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to take that. But they all saw it. They knew it. That was like the prized possession. So I take the stuff down to the basement, okay? And there it is, World's Finest Milk Chocolate. And guess what? In the morning, they want, I want our kids. We want our kids. Go get our candy. Go get our candy. All right. So I go down, get the candy, bring it up. Check it out. Out of 400 pieces of candy, the rich and the poor, a mouse in my basement attacked the world's finest chocolate. That's what we found in the morning. And that's a mouse tooth. So, um, so what's the moral of the story? Mice are picky eaters or mice like good chocolate. Dad should have eaten this candy bar before taking it to safe storage. Big houses have bigger candy. Dad needs to get some more mouse traps. And folks, that ends my evening pest show. Um, maybe I'll do a more in-depth one of each one of these. We didn't have time to do all of them. Um, I only have so much time to put a PowerPoint together for these things. I will put this up a little bit later if you wanna see it again, if you missed it. I will also load it up to YouTube. And it'll be on Cleveland Marco. 
uh, Cleveland Marco on YouTube. If you do go to YouTube, um, hey, you know, you could uh, uh, um, subscribe. You know, if you want to leave a comment, that's cool too. So you guys have a nice evening. I hope you guys learned some stuff, and I'll put this up a little bit later. You guys have a good evening. Take care.